guys what's up welcome back to the channel my gosh we have been thrown off our upload schedule haven't we to be totally transparent well i told y'all um that other video got taken down because it was flagged for it's like content which happens because this is a true crime channel but then like the last three videos i uploaded all got flagged for violent content and usually when it happens back to back like that it's not me it's like a youtube thing so i was like okay i'm gonna give youtube a week because ain't no way i mean this is a true crime channel but we talk about the same ish every time okay and um if you've been with me for a while you know that's happened before where like they just flag everything and it's not like a huge deal but it's like really discouraging like when you work hard on something and they're just like no no thank you so um oh like i was saying if you've been with me a while then you know that's happened to me before i truly think it's like a back-end thing because my videos are always the same y'all know i don't like to get too nitty-gritty into the gory stuff that's not my thing that will never be my thing i don't like that i don't like blood i don't watch scary movies like all of that extra stuff i don't do a whole lot of that you know okay i keep losing my train of thought i was about to say if you've been with me for a while you know that's happened to me before and what i was trying to say is i just have to start uploading the videos and let them sit on the channel for like two to three days before we upload so it'll be about a week since y'all have seen me but once y'all see me we'll be back uploading the way we were before and I'll go back to editing certain words out of the videos and stuff like that, you know. So we can try to stay in YouTube's good graces, babe, because I don't have the time for YouTube to have me in a headlock, okay? I'ma lose every time. I'ma lose every time, okay? But yeah, I had a goal in my head of 16 videos this month and we're still going for that. I'm not giving up, was a little discouraged. I can't lie, I can't lie. But we, we back. We back up on the horse. Okay? It's bucking, but we back up on the mother horse. <laughs> I'm trying to decide whether or not I want to do my makeup. <laughs> I'm going to be filming all day today, though, so we'll be fine. This is how y'all know I love you because it's summer. Y'all know the kids have been home all summer. And it's been fun. I can't lie. <laughs> I can't lie. We've been having a blast. But today is my first like kid free day in a minute. And you know what I'm doing? I'm sitting down and I'm filming all day. But anyway, we are in Silverton, Ohio for today's case. And it is February 19th of 2000. And at about 5 p.m. that afternoon, 911 calls come in from a apartment complex in Silverton with reports of shots fired. A young man was shot at the door of his apartment and um, it causes a huge commotion like people can see him from the door that heard the shots they come outside um, multiple people call into 911 when first responders arrive this young man is still alive but he's not talking answering questions he's struggling to breathe witnesses at the scene said they heard the young man say no 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 before about three or four shots were fired February 19th was a Saturday. It was a Saturday at five o'clock. Plenty of people were out. There was tons of witnesses, like I said, tons of 911 calls. The young man who had been shot, he was 24 year old Rayshawn Berry, and he is identified at the scene by his sister. And unfortunately, Rayshawn would be pronounced dead at the scene, and it is four gunshots confirmed. He had been shot four times. And despite, you know, first responders being on the scene pretty quickly, um, you know, being shot four, t four times at close range, not the easiest thing, you know. But this type of brazen attack, being shot four times at the entrance of his apartment, in the middle of the day, lots of witnesses around, was um, very strange and uncommon for Silverton. They hadn't had a homicide since 1990 and that one was very different. It was a mother who killed her daughter who was only six years old. So, you know, very different crimes. Silverton is about 20 to 25 minutes outside of Cincinnati. And in Silverton, violent crimes like this were very few and far between. A lot of the police and first responders on the scene, this was the first time in their career that they had even responded to the scene of a homicide because they only had homicides maybe once every five to ten years like this type of thing just didn't happen 
in this area at the time. Can't speak to Silverton now, okay? If you live there now and things are different, I don't know. I'm talking about what we're talking about right now. Spare me. Spare me in the comments, please. So fortunately for Rashawn, um, police in Silverton recognize right away that this is not something that they normally deal with and they don't have the experience to properly and swiftly solve this type of homicide. So they reach out to Cincinnati PD and bring in a detective more experienced with homicide investigations, which is so good. I love that. Let's not waste time trying to solve a murder for the first time let's call in reinforcements absolutely and in talking to friends and family this is very strange to be happening to Rayshon. Rayshon was a barber everybody loved the barber don't nobody mess with the barber you know and he was only 24 he kept to himself he didn't mess with anybody so they're thinking that this was probably something random because he had also just recently moved into this apartment complex he had moved in with his sister and hadn't even been there for a month when the shooting happened. And like I said, he was chilling, minding his business when this happened. He was even holding the remote control to the TV in his hand that um, was found near his body. He had obviously dropped it in the midst of whatever happened, the batteries that came out, but he was seemingly just sitting on the couch watching TV when all hell broke loose, you know? But like I said, at the scene, it's a lot of commo, 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 wow, commotion, chaos, lots of witnesses, you know, on an afternoon, on a Saturday, lots of people who saw what was going on. There was even a group of guys who saw the perpetrator running from the scene and took off on foot after him, but they lost him. So in talking to witnesses, there's a lot of people to go through, a lot to um, filter through. There are accounts of two suspicious vehicles being in the area at the time of the murder. The first one is a white car that some people saw speed off shortly after the gunshots. They actually do have a license plate number for that car. They find the white vehicle and pull it over. They find out that the vehicle belongs to a woman and she does admit to being in the area at the time of the shooting, but she says she was in the car, you know, and when she heard shots break out, she put it in drive and got up out of there. You know what I'm saying? So they don't think she's involved in the shooting, but their second vehicle is a blue vehicle. And witnesses reported that this vehicle was in the area with both the front and back license plates removed. So Rayshawn's sister, who he lived with at the time, was there during the shooting. She's one of the first people who called 911, right? And his sister tells detectives that Rashawn was expecting company. His friend Jason was supposed to come over at about five when everything went down. And the description of Jason that his sister gives to detective matches the description of the shooter from witnesses who were outside during the shooting. Black athletic build with facial hair, which to me is extremely vague. Black athletic build, facial hair. I don't know, in my opinion, that's very vague, but that's who they were looking for. And they obviously need to catch up to Jason. So they're trying to locate Jason, but they don't have much luck in that department. They don't have a solid address for him. They talked to Rashawn's girlfriend and she's able to tell them a little bit more about Jason. She says she does know that he owned a gun and he was having some money troubles, but she didn't know much about him, you know, otherwise, and she didn't know where he was staying, okay? But in the meantime, between time of them trying to locate Jason, they continue to look for more witnesses and they decide to travel down the path that the group of men were chasing somebody running from the scene. Remember we talked about that a little bit earlier. They decide to go down the road that the men chased that man on to see if anybody on that street had seen anything. And in this canvas of this street, they come across a driving school and the man who owns and operates the driving school said he, shortly after the murder, Saw somebody walking down the street, but the man was drenched in sweat. I mean, sweating his ass off on a cold day, February in Ohio, but this man is sweating. And he said he thought that was weird. He took notice of it, but he remembered it because he saw the man walk off towards the post office. Then the man came back to ask him what time the post office closed. So the driving school instructor talked to this man who was drenched in sweat walking down the road after first seeing him and finding him suspicious. And they don't know if this person and Jason are the same person. The description is still kind of vague. However, 
Jason brings himself into the police department and he tells detectives, you know, um, I do own a gun and I have had previous run-ins with the law, but um, I'm not your guy, you know, Rashawn was my friend and I didn't make it over before the shots happened. Like I wasn't there. But detectives know they'll be able to confirm or deny that through the surveillance footage at the post office. But this happened to be a long weekend. February 21st was President's Day. You'll know President's Day is the third Monday of every February, so they couldn't go into the post office until it opened again that Tuesday, February 22nd. So they have to wait till the 22nd to view the surveillance footage. They also have a few other random leads that don't really lead anywhere. They find out that there's a drug dealer in the area who uses the name Rayshawn as an alias, you know? And they thought maybe it could have been like some type of retaliation, but ended up being a mistaken identity. They were looking for the drug dealer, but found Rayshawn Barry, you know? But that don't lead them anywhere. Detectives are the first people in the post office that Tuesday morning after the long weekend, right? And this happened at about 5 p.m. So their perpetrator was probably one of the last people to walk into the post office, right? So they're checking it out and they see that there is a jacket folded up in one of the little cubbies at the post office. Like, you know, where you are filling out your letter or your whatever you have and there's the little desk that has everything you need inside, envelopes, pens, paper, da 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 da. A jacket was tucked up in there and their perpetrator was wearing a black jacket as reported by witnesses. So before they can even get to surveillance footage, they're thinking their perpetrator ran inside of the post office to maybe switch up his look a little bit before fleeing. Obviously the surveillance footage paints a clear picture for detectives and they do see a man come in with the black jacket on and obviously their other suspects are ruled out right away because this man is older way older than they expected probably in his mid 40s okay and they do see him on camera enter in the jacket and leave without it and luckily for detectives in this surveillance footage their perpetrator has a very distinct look he has a patch of like white gray hair on the top of his head which can either come from like graying getting older or like you know when somebody has a birthmark on their scalp it makes their hair discolored and his little white patch is sticking out clean as day on the top of his head in this surveillance footage so what they decide to do is release his image out to the media i mean he's got this white patch on the top of his head somebody was bound to recognize him and it doesn't take long for their perpetrator the man in the post office to be identified as owen hobbs owen hobbs was 52 so obviously way older than they initially thought their suspect would be right he's actually identified by one of his friends his friend said owen came to his house shortly after the murders and he was obviously disheveled his friend at the time didn't know what was going on, but once he saw Owen's picture in the news, in the post office, he was like, okay, yeah, this is what happened that day. He murdered this young man and then came to my house. The friend goes on to say that Owen was in his backyard. He don't know if he was in here, in there getting rid of the weapon or what, but he said when he came from out of the backyard, Owen said that the that his friend's dog had bit him and he had like a cut on his hand but his friend knew like you know something weird was going on he just didn't know exactly what and he hadn't known about the shootings yet right he didn't put two and two together in his head until seeing i went on the news okay but the friend goes further and puts two and two together for detectives the friend tells detectives that owen's ex-wife worked at the post office he ran into not only did she work at the post office he ran into but she lived in the apartment complex where the shooting happened and they're thinking it boils down to a case of mistaken identity that after a contentious divorce owen hobbs went to those apartments looking for his ex-wife 
his ex-wife Judy lived in apartment 11 and Rashawn and his sister lived in apartment 12. So you know for detectives this is obviously their motive. He went to the wrong apartment but was looking for his ex-wife. And after shooting Rashawn and not getting what he wanted at the apartment, he was looking for her at her job. You know, he didn't just run into the post office randomly. So obviously now they're looking for Judy and Owen Hobbs. They wanna obviously get Judy to let her know if she's in danger before anything can happen to her. And so they bring her into the station. And Miss Judy was absolutely devastated to, you know, find out that Rashawn was murdered by her ex-husband because he was looking for her and he was only one apartment off. Now, Miss Judy wasn't at the apartments during the shooting. She had left out, like I said, it was a busy Saturday and had come back shortly after the shooting happened and was obviously denied access to her apartment with everything going on. And so she had to leave again. But detectives learned from Miss Judy, you know, that he had been stalking her. Um, he didn't know exactly where she lived, obviously, up until that day, but he had been stopping people delivering mail, asking about her, where she at, where she's living with, who she's living with, if she has a boyfriend. She said she was fearful of going to the police because Owen Hobbs was a former sheriff. He had been fired, relieved of his duty, because he had gotten mixed up into some sort of larceny situation. They were doing some type of like undercover sting operation. They were using money in this operation, you know, to like catch whoever they're trying to catch. And he took the money. So he was fired after 17 years as a sheriff. And he was also a former Marine. So she felt like the best thing for her to do was to just hide. And so they easily apprehend him at his home. Okay. Mm, he don't have no fight left in him. He, I'm sure as a former police officer, um, knew that they had what they needed to have on him. He didn't put up much of a fight. They find the outfit he was wearing that day in his home. And his vehicle does match the blue vehicle that was missing its license plate at the scene. And he did own a weapon that matched the weapon that shot Rayshawn. However, they were never able to recover his gun. So they don't tell Owen Hobbs that they have the surveillance footage from the post office they just let him you know deny 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 before confronting him with the footage he says he wasn't in silverton at all that day and they present him with the surveillance footage after letting him lie for a while he is visibly taken aback by seeing himself on the surveillance footage but he still decides to lie he said he was at the post office visiting his wife even though we know that's not true but that's pretty much all he says before asking for his attorney. But even without him confessing, I mean, the pieces really fall together and obviously there's a ton of witnesses. I think he went to the apartment complex looking for his ex-wife, Judy. And however he got this information, they were one off. He rung for the wrong door and so the wrong person came to the door maybe he shot Rayshawn thinking he had the right door but Judy was living with a man or she had a man over maybe he thought you know the two of them were some type of together you know he just shot off not thinking or not even toying with the idea that maybe he had the wrong apartment number and it's just you know twisted fate you know whereas Rashawn's sister probably would have been the one to open the door any other day because it was her apartment Rashawn was expect expecting his friend Jason so he was the one who met Owen Hobbs at the door I mean and just to think that he shot Rashawn four times without even knowing who he was is insane now Owen Hobbs is convicted okay and sentenced to 15 years in prison, but that don't matter because he died in 2015 before he was ever released. Which I think is just a little bit of instant karma. Well, you know what I mean. Dying in prison just a few years before he would have been eligible for parole. <laughs> so yeah, I think karma put a nice little bow on that case. It's a good thing he went to jail when he did because I mean if you're willing to shoot the per first person who comes to the door you don't know their name you don't know them from a can of paint you shot them four times yeah you need to go to prison mm -hmm, and never be able to get out like that is so insane and speaking of insanity okay this true crime TikTok was well, not necessarily true crime TikTok I just have to know if I'm an evil person 
because uh, I understand what this lady is saying, but baby, it has sent TikTok into an uproar. Listen, you are either with me on this one and solidarity, or you're gonna think I'm a monster. Either way, I'm gonna share, because that's what I do. I overshare my life on the internet for shits and giggles. I'm a dog owner, okay? We have two Australian Shepherds and one Alapaha Blue Blood Bulldog. If you don't know what the fuck that is, I'll insert a picture of him. Here he is. Here's my little asshole. Well, he's not little, he's 100 pounds. These were our three dogs before we had kids, okay? And we could handle the three of them. We lived in the city. We didn't really have good space for them. We ended up moving into the country. We live on almost two acres of land. They've got a whole ass fucking backyard to play in. Well, you know what? I'm just gonna fucking rip the band-aid off. Now I have two kids and like, I I'm ready when they are, if you, if you catch my drift. Having dogs while having a one and a two year old is so overstimulating. I'm not saying I dream about their death, I love them, but I dream about the idea of not having dogs in my house anymore while also having two animals that I birthed. I'm fucking tired of these dogs, man. The way they're barking just, oh God. And I know you're thinking, why did you get dogs if they were just gonna be replaced with your children? Did you think that I thought this was gonna happen? Of course I didn't. My dogs were my everything before I had kids. I took my little Aussies with me everywhere. Those are my little homies. Those are my bitches. Literally, cause they're girl dogs. I didn't know that this was gonna happen. I didn't know that I was gonna have human children and they were kind of just gonna be like kicked to the curb emotionally. I love them. I still hang out with them sometimes when it's nice outside. Sometimes we all go outside together. Not the bulldog. He's he's too unpredictable to be around my kids. Why don't you just rehome them? Because I love them, okay? Just think about how nice it must be to put your children to sleep and then not have to fucking deal with your dogs. Or wake up in the morning and make yourself coffee without having to chase your fucking 100 pound bulldog so that he doesn't eat a shit anymore. That's the shit I'm talking about. How nice it must be to clean your home and for that dog smell to not be there. Dogs are gonna be the death of me. You're telling me. We're only halfway? That's what you're telling me. Got another seven years of this? Fuck me, man. You don't need to call PETA or anything, okay? My dogs are taken care of. They have a beautiful backyard that I'm staring into right now. They have all the toys. I'm just fucking complaining. And like I said, you're either with me or you're not. To the ones that are, I get you. It is hard having toddlers and animals. Oh, fuck me. Fuck, mama. I bug. It's fly season, girl. For anyone that's like, I love my dogs. I love them as much as my children. They're part of our family. Mm -mm. Bitch. If there was mama? a house fire and you only had time to grab your kids or your dogs, who are you grabbing? I'll leave it at that. Anyways, that's our morning vent sesh. Peace out, Girl Scout. I mean, do you get what she's saying? She has two kids, one, 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 two, and then three big ass dogs and that her life would be easier without the big ass dogs and that dogs are optional. Like, I don't understand why people are being so mean to her in the comments. And if I was her, I mean, if it came to my mental health and my sanity and keeping my house clean and taking care of my kids in the best way possible, um i would get rid of the dogs so i would have more energy people are pe and people are in the comments like oh my god i love my dogs more than i love myself like i would never think about giving them up you love your dog more than you love yourself what that's alarming to me in and of itself and that's one of the main reasons why i don't want to get a dog because i know i like to keep my house like clean in a certain way and dogs are just too needy i love dogs but i'm not willing to get off give up my sanity and the peace in my home for another dog <laughs> but i don't know like i saw one person respond to her video in in a stitch saying like her dog that she had she had a dog and a son and that her dog was like her firstborn son I don't I mean I don't I just don't see the equivalent here why are we comparing dogs and children she's not saying she want to get rid of her kids she's saying she would like to have a break from the dogs whatever I don't know people are strange y'all let me know how you're feeling about that one in the comments down below as always and I will see you guys again probably tomorrow or the day after that no longer than that <laughs>